welcome to Pittsfield Green Drinks. This event is organized by Berkshire Environmental Action Team, also known as BEAT. Uh, my name is Chelsea Simmons, and I'm BEAT's Education and Outreach Coordinator. If you don't already know about us, you can find out much more on our website, thebeatnews.org. We work together with our community to protect the environment for wildlife in support of the natural world that sustains us all. On our website, you can easily stay up to date on environmental events, jobs, um, meetings, projects that are happening here in Western Mass, um, as well as statewide. We have a community calendar where we compile a list of events that other organizations have sent us. Um, we also have an environmental jobs board where we post new jobs um, that are typically in the environmental field. Uh, and then twice a, twice a month, we go through the state's environmental monitor um, and just list the big projects uh, for the Berkshires and the Connecticut River Valley, as well as statewide. Um, that we should all just be keeping an eye on. And then every week we update our public notices page uh, for Berkshire, Hampshire, Hampton, and Franklin counties. Uh, they're mostly conservation commission meetings, but there are other environmentally relevant ones there as well. And you can actually find all of that plus local news articles on um, local statewide, uh, regional, national, global news articles um, in the Beat News, our weekly e-newsletter. If you'd like to subscribe to that, you can go here on our website, current weekly newsletter, and subscribe. Many of you probably already know this, but Beat is a 501c3 nonprofit. So that means that all of our funding comes from generous donations and grants. Um, so programs like this are only possible thanks to those who support BEAT. Uh, if you'd like to support BEAT, you can go here on our donate page uh, on our website, and thank you very much. Uh, join us next month for our December Pittsfield Green Drinks. Uh, it's taking place on Tuesday, December 20th uh, on Zoom at 6 p.m. Um, it's just going to be with beat staff, so we'll talk about highlights of 2022 um, and some of we'll just discuss beats important work from this past year and then explore what's to come in 2023. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, you can find it on our event calendar and also register through there. So that's all I have to say for now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it off to Laura Marks, um, our speaker tonight, and I'll let her introduce herself further. Great. Thank you so much, Chelsea and Jane. Um, I am not only a fan of BEAT, I am a supporter of you guys. You do amazing things out there in the Berkshires, and I'm glad to finally be able to be part of Green Drinks. Chelsea asked me um, quite a while ago, and we couldn't make the timing work until now, but thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I, I do have my green drink here. Appropriately, given the weather, it is um, honey vanilla chamomile tea, which I'm very excited about. So, um, and I know that uh, if we were if we were in person, we'd keep this casual. I, I know a lot of you. I'm so excited to see Linda here and Lauren. Uh, there's lots of people who've been part of making the work of the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage possible. So um, I am going to go through kind of what we've done for the past 10 years and then leave a lot of time for questions and discussion. And just to quickly introduce myself before I launch into the slides, um, I work for the Nature Conservancy's Massachusetts chapter. I'm a climate solutions scientist there, and I lead, among other things, our work on the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage Partnership, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I do have some slides to show, so I'm going to set that up. Um, so just in case some of you aren't familiar with the Nature Conservancy. Um, we are an international conservation nonprofit. Our mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And I grabbed this flowery uh, paragraph from our main website because I think there are a couple things that I highlighted here that kind of make the connection between the work that we're doing here in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage and the fact that we work the same way wherever we work in any of the 50 states or, or the countries where we work. So we really use science to figure out where to focus and choose places where we, um, where we work on conservation. 
In many of those places, we have a lot of on the ground experience. So the Nature Conservancy is an accredited land trust and we have conserved a lot of nature preserves around the state and in other states where we work. And um, just to give some perspective to that, when I first started working for TNC, I was in a little two person office in Chester, Massachusetts. Actually it was a one person office in Beckett before I got there and then it was a two person office in Chester and then it became three person. Um, and so it was, really a lot of our work um, has to be grounded in the community. And then when we're doing kind of like big level spatial science, we always need to get out on the ground and ground truth that and actually collect data and see what's happening there. And one of the really cool things about working for TNC is then I get to take that stuff and use the fact that we have a lot of policy expertise to scale that up. So if something worked really well on the ground, maybe we can make that the norm elsewhere. Maybe we can mainstream that and have that happen a lot of places. Maybe we can write it into grant programs or policy. Um, and we're also really good at directing funding and that is, that's needed to make all this work possible. So all those pieces come into play in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage. But I just wanna start with that first piece, like why are we focused here? When you zoom out, by the way, Canada has forests too. I always feel like I have to say that. So does Mexico, probably. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that area isn't super forested, but you know, this map just shows the US. But um, you can see this dark green swath as you move down through uh, the Northern Appalachian Mountains and the Acadian Mountains on the Canadian side that aren't shown here, the Central Appalachians and the Southern Appalachians. You can really see this wildlife corridor. And unsurprisingly, when people look at where animals have moved and where they're gonna need to move in order to adapt to climate change, that area pops out again. You can see this line of different species that will need to move right through the area where most of us are now. I'm, I'm based a little bit east of most of you guys in Westfield, but this area of Western Mass is really critical. And many years ago, um, about more than 15, I think, uh, a large group of partners got together to form something called the Staying Connected Initiative because they could see those patterns both on the ground and in studies of animal movement. And they knew that this area of Canada and New England and New York was really critical. And we're lucky in this area to have a lot of large areas of protected habitat. So you've got the Adirondacks in New York, you've got Green Mountains, um, uh, and the White Mountains in Vermont and New Hampshire. You have huge protected areas in Maine. But often in between those, there's an area that doesn't have as much protected land and is also much more fragmented. And in some cases, a little bit, the habitat gets a little disconnected. So what you see on here are some arrows that are connecting core forests. And one of them, way down at the bottom, you see the one that's the southernmost sticking its two legs out, that is the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage. It is, I call it the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage when I'm here just because it's a name that makes sense locally, but I also want to point out that uh, regionally its name is the Green Mountains to Hudson Highlands Linkage because those two mostly protected areas that it is connecting are the Green Mountains in Vermont and the areas of the Hudson Highlands to the southwest of us a little bit in New York. This is just a slide showing some of the partners that are part of the Staying Connected Initiative. It is a huge, really cool group with, um, it's a public-private partnership as well as going across two states. So we have state agencies and provincial agencies in Canada, as well as land trusts, nonprofits, um, watershed associations, just a whole bunch of people working together to make sure that wildlife can move safely through this area. Now, one of the challenges with working in our area in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage is that here in the southern part of New England, we have a lot of amazing habitat. And you saw that map. We have a huge amount of forest. We also have a lot of roads going across it. I always have to point out two things with this, with this map. First of all, Rhode Island does have roads. I don't know why there weren't roads in this data set in Rhode Island, except for one. Um, also, when I in initially made this map, it was entirely purple. 
when I turn on all the roads, all you can see in parts of Northwestern Connecticut and Western Mass is purple. This is just showing, showing major roads like, you know, state like Route 20, Route 8, um, that sort of level of road. So what we get throughout the Berkshire wildlife linkage is this situation where you have a lot of habitat and a lot of animals in very close proximity to a lot of roads. This is Route 112 in Huntington. You see a truck going by there at the top and down at the bottom are mink tracks. Um, so this is, this is a very typical situation. It is not surprising then that these two things intersect a lot. We have a lot of animal vehicle collisions. That is a problem both if you care about the wildlife and if you care about the people. So this chart is just showing collisions with large things like deer or something big enough to actually be reported, like to cause some damage and end up on this list. This is this report is now a couple years old, but it's from um, Mass DOT and Mass Wildlife that sort of gathered all these data. And so there are a lot of these. They often turn out pretty poorly, both for the person and the animal that's hit. And you can see that number is going up um, over the years as well. So our vision in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage is that it is possible to have both of these things in close proximity, but the best scenario is that wildlife and water can get under the roads while people are driving over them. And there are also other things that we can do in terms of our land management. So for example, um, there are lots of, of places where there are multiple fields and in between there might be one little row of trees or someone has an area that's mowed and their yard and they can choose whether or not to mow right up to the stream or leave a little buffer that is, you know, shrubby and forested. Those really skinny um, areas of, of shrubs and trees and sort of edges between different types of habitat are actually really useful for animals and they can become wildlife corridors. Similarly, streams are natural corridors for animals if they don't run into barriers as they go down. So if they don't run into, um, you know, a bridge, for example, that doesn't allow them to continue passing under there. So um, the, the Stain Connected Initiative, again, does the same things in every one of its linkages. And here in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage, we are really trying to do three things. We want to fill in the gaps in protected land. So we want those cores to be protected, but also the corridors between them. We want to improve transportation infrastructure so that wildlife and water can safely get under the roads. And this last part is really squishy and it's a little hard to define and it's even harder to fund, but it's really important. I'm referring to it as finding their place. So I want people, the Berkshire wildlife linkage is huge. Um, it's part of, of four states. It's got a bunch of different partners. And in general, each one of these partners has a small section of the linkage that's really important to them that they focus on. And that's great because it all adds up. Similarly, I want people to find their place within the partnership. So everyone within this partnership is bringing something slightly different. And that also makes for a really strong group. This is not a complete list, but this is an example of some of the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage partners, some of whom are on here today. <laughs> um, you know, so you can see that it's taking a lot of land trusts, a lot of state agencies, a lot of different groups, all, all bringing their own piece and their own geographic focus to add up to a lot of action. Um, and what I want to do with the rest of the presentation before I, I turn it over to discussion, to discussion is just talk about what we have done in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage because, and Jane, this threw me when I like calculate, it's been almost 10 years. So we started with the wildlife tracking study back in the winter of 2013 and 2014. So we're almost coming up on a decade of action in this area, which is really cool. Um, so I want to talk about what we've done in the, in the past almost 10 years and kind of take a look forward as to, as to what's coming next. So one of the key questions after we laid out what we wanted to do was where, because it is neither possible nor probably desirable to protect the entire Berkshire wildlife linkage. And similarly, we probably are not gonna be able to rebuild every one of the presumably hundreds to thousands of miles of road that is in the linkage. So one of the early things that we wanted to do is figure out if we have limited resources, where would be the best place to spend a dollar or put an hour of staff time? 
And so we did a lot of stuff to try to figure that out. These are mink tracks from way back in 2014. Um, one of the most fun things I've done at TNC is work with the, the volunteers, many of whom were trained by BEAT um, through the Keeping Track program. Uh, we had an amazing, we had amazing weather. We had so many storms <laughs> that year. And these intrepid volunteers with a couple leaders, including um, uh, a former um, beat staffer. Um, we went out, they went out and they tracked, they walked these transects along roads and over into the forest. And they were looking for whether or not there were different tracks kind of farther away from the roads and also where were animals crossing the roads. So these are mink tracks. This is the same mink slide from 2014. This particular mink pretty much directly protected its own habitat. In 2017, the Conwell Duck Preserve um, was conserved by Hilltown Land Trust, sparked by um, some photos that I sent the landowner and said, you know, there's this mink and it's super cool. We saw it on your land and then it went across the road onto Mass Wildlife wildlife management area. And that really started the process of her working with Hilltown to donate her land, which was very cool. I did, I did find out that that original owner passed away um, recently. So she was able to get this done before she did. Um, and now it's this amazing legacy that is, that is open to the public there in Worthington. Um, there was a lot of land production happening around this time. So between 2017 and 2020, we actually had something called the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage Catalyst Fund. And we were awarding small grants to groups that needed some due diligence funding. Um, even when land is donated to a land trust, there's often a significant amount of costs if you think about having to do a survey and an appraisal and all the legal fees. And um, so this was, and sometimes management plans. So this was helping to cover some of those. I put this map on, even though it doesn't look super impressive. Also, the colors are different, which is another story because I'm using two different um, data sets. But so this is an area, what you're seeing on here is uh, basically parts of Middlefield, Chester, Chesterfield, um, Huntington, and Worthington, I believe. Um, and and you are seeing just a little bit of Berkshire County over on the on the west side. So this doesn't look super impressive, right? Um, until and let me see if I can. Um, maybe I can't with the permission I have here on Zoom. But um, if you guys are looking, there's a little orange. So this is the land that was protected in 2013 at the top, and then land protected in the bottom in 2022. You can see there's a little like orange parcel that's sort of up by 143. There's um, the Conwell Duck Preserve that I mentioned uh, shows up in purple along Route 112. There are just these in corridors, it's little pieces. It's individual landowners, it's small parcels. By their nature, these areas are a little more fragmented. And so this is what it takes. So even though when you look at these maps, they don't look dramatically different. If you're an animal that lives in an area that is now three parcels closer to protected land, your, your pathway just got a little more secure because you can go through some developed land, but you're eventually gonna wanna get to more natural habitat and open space. And the other thing about this bottom map is um, I actually used the, the Mass GIS system to show this and it automatically does the colors. So this is showing state land, it's showing nonprofit land, it's showing other private orgs, um, it's showing federal land down in blue at the bottom. It's a real patchwork. You can see that partnership playing out here and how many different players it takes to actually get to protecting a, a continuous corridor. So moving on in 2017, we also put out some wildlife cameras, including places under the Mass Pike. This is a, a deer walking under the Mass Pike. Uh, we had a master's student from um, the University of Vermont Field Naturalist Program who did a lot of work to show us what types of animals were going across different roads and going under culverts. And then in 2018, Housatonic Valley Association did an amazing set of field work measuring hundreds of culverts and bridges for terrestrial passage. This is very similar to the work that BEAT has done on aquatic passage surveys, where they're looking at how the um, culverts and bridges are, are passing water and aquatic wildlife. 
uh, Scott Jackson at UMass and others developed a terrestrial passage survey that kind of does the same thing, but then adds on that piece of um, where animals that don't necessarily live in the water are able to get through and not. Uh, and um, Jane, maybe during the Q&A, I don't remember if the training has already happened or is about to, but I know there was a training for this kind of around this time um, so that more volunteers could get trained. I'll look it up. <laughs> That's okay. No, no worries. Um, so they, so Housatonic Valley Association contracted with TNC and, and wrote this amazing report. Um, and so we have maps like this, which is kind of cool. This is showing the mass pike um, as it goes through the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage, basically cutting it, you know, north to south. And we now know where there's complete passage, you know, wildlife can just keep walking on dry land right under the pike and there's plenty of clearance versus no passage. There's no way something's going to leap up, crawl through a tiny pipe, like crawl over a barrier at the end. You know, they just aren't going to be able to do it. Or a partial passage where maybe it works for some of the smaller animals or animals that don't mind getting their feet wet, but, um, but doesn't work for everything. And then in 2019 through 2021, uh, we got a huge amount of help from the University of Massachusetts um, Data for the Common Good program. And uh, they built something called Fox Bounder, which I really wish I could share with you, but we are, um, the pandemic and various disruptions to the students working on it mean that there's there's code. Someone who's really interested can use this tool now. We really wanna have a user-friendly web interface so that people can just um, use it without having uh, to jump through a lot of hoops. But what this software that the students created does is it uses machine learning to draw bounding boxes around animals in the thousands and thousands of photos that you can generate from wildlife cameras, which means a person doesn't have to sit there and go through 10,000 photos. And I use this one because if I'm being honest with myself, without those boxes, I'm not sure that I'd see that squirrel. And the software is freakishly good at finding this. It's one of those, you know, you train it and then it's a black box. We don't really know how it is distinguishing those slightly gray pixels from the just a little bit different shade of gray on some of the leaves, but it works really well. It finds eyes, it finds tails, it finds whole animals, it finds little blurs of fur that are, you know, going at the bottom of the screen. And I am I'm very excited about this tool eventually being usable. We just need to get the timing right with um, a student who can, you know, who has the right and very specialized skill set to uh, take a machine learning tool and turn it into a website that anyone can use. So all of this put together um, gives us a fairly good indication of where the places are in the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage where we think it's really critical not to use a, lose a connection between habitats. And you see these in all, don't worry about the colors, but all the ovals here. Similarly, again, don't worry about the colors, all of the uh, lines here are road segments that bisect areas of habitat without using the data on the passage assessments. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're blocking wildlife because they could have a good passage under there. Um, it just means it's a place we need to focus and then look and do the on the ground work to see is it really a barrier? Is it a potential barrier? Is it a barrier until that culvert you know, fills up with sediment? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, I also, again, want to, so anyone can use this map. There's an interactive map at bit.do slash linkage map. You can play around with this. I also want to acknowledge, I've talked about UMass multiple times. The data that allowed us to, um, to zoom into these areas and decide where we we're going to put out wildlife cameras and dig deeper also came from UMass. It was called the Critical Linkages 2 data set. And um, that same group led by Scott Jackson is actually doing an update of that analysis right now. So there'll be updated data uh, across the whole region, basically showing, again, really answering that question, if I break a connection between these habitats, where is that a really bad thing? It just impacts the whole rest of the habitat network. So where are those pinch points and those key areas that we want to be sure uh, we have protected land, you know, going across that so that, that that connection is always secure and 
we want to make sure that the roads have some ability for the wildlife to get across them. So um, I feel pretty good about our where answer. You know, we have a lot of data and maps, but then we needed to move to how. Mass DOT has also been a key partner in this work. So remember the deer going under that structure? This is the other side of it. This is maybe like the tracking stuff was more fun. This was maybe tied for like equally cool. Jane went out with me to this uh, this particular culvert, I think one, one year. Um, it's pretty hard to get to some of these places. This one you can bush back to. It's a lot easier if you have someone in a DOT truck who just drives you on the pike and drops you off places. So their, their cooperation and support was really key. And one of the things that they are doing to continue that support is they are using our data on terrestrial passage surveys and putting it into something called MAPIT, which is their project intake tool. So whenever any transportation infrastructure project gets put out to bid, contractors have to go into the system and kind of show where it is that they're um, intending to bid and work on. And in the places where we have data, where it's a um, priority road segment in the linkage with information about how it functions for wildlife, that's actually gonna pop up. And the contractor is gonna be told, okay, listen, when you write your bid, you need to think about how you are going to, at the very least maintain the connectivity here and ideally you're going to explain to us how you're going to improve it through this project which is is huge um we also are collecting more and more examples from other states so we have places where other states that are part of the stay and connected initiative have done really cool um, wildlife shelves or benches under bridges um, this is an example from here in massachusetts right sizing a culvert in bucket so if you think from the perspective of an animal Think about how much easier it is if you're traveling along the stream to keep going in that second picture than in the first where you had to sort of go up and over the road or decide if you were going to go into these boxes and get your feet wet and, and continue on. Similarly for fish passage, that was a real probably not happening um, in the first picture and now is, is much improved in the second one. And then in New York, they did this critter walk that's been used as a demonstration project too. So they also have wildlife cameras in there. So they've seen bobcats, for example, going across that um, through this otherwise pretty inhospitable culvert where um, we're doing something really big wasn't an option, but they were able to work with New York DOT to install this, this critter walk. So, <laughs> I was trying to just lay out, you know, when you're a journalist, you're like, who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's like, all right, first decade, who we built this really strong partnership that has survived COVID, that has survived leadership changes of different groups, like really impressive group of people who keep showing up again and again because they have a shared vision of a landscape that, you know, moves wildlife and people safely. What are we doing? We're protecting key lands, which we've been doing at a pretty decent clip, ensuring that wildlife can get under roads, building connectivity into existing systems like the way DOT bids out projects, for example. When is this happening? This is going to be a multi-decade long project because when we talk about land protection, usually we're talking about an individual landowner or family, and they're going to act on their land on a timeline that works for them. Similarly, the transportation system, there are so many culverts and bridges. Often this is going to be driven by catastrophic storm events that force the issue, that force areas to be upgraded or rebuilt, or by DOT and regional planning agency cycles, often on a five-year basis. What do we want to do in the next five years? Where are we doing this? We're hoping to direct a lot of work to the priority connectivity areas and the road segments that I showed on that map that were informed by both our spatial data and our field data collected on the ground. How we're taking all these demonstration projects every time they happen and really making them mainstream. We're trying to communicate them. And by the way, BEAT has another one of those, the Churchill Brook um, uh, work as well. So, you know, there's lots Every year, there's like kind of another example popping up somewhere, and we want to pull that all together. Uh, why are we doing that? Because we really we want to create that linkage where um, people and wildlife can both safely live and move now and into the future. This is where things start. This is where I start thinking forward. So there is now more federal and state funding than we have had in my, admittedly, not nearly as long as some of you guys have been in your careers, but 
decently long um, than we've had access to. So there's the IIJA, there's the infrastructure bill, there's Recovery in America's Wildlife Act. There are revisions of the state wildlife action plan, which often uh, can unlock some forest service and interior funding. There's America the Beautiful or 30 by 30 working to protect 30% of um, of the U.S. lands by 30 by 2030, and the Inflation Reduction Act or Build Back Better. So all of these sources of funding are coming to a place where this partnership, I think, has something to say about how to spend that well and how to prioritize, and that's really exciting to me. This is not an exciting slide, but it is an exciting concept. I grabbed it from earlier today. This is a draft of. Um, a document that the Highstead Foundation has very kindly lent us uh, a portion of time of two of their staff. And they have been interviewing people and looking at case studies and reading up on the IAJA bill. And they are trying to put together um, information for DOT. Often with federal funding, it's like you wait and wait and wait. And then it's like, okay, you got a month to apply. So we want to make sure that DOT has what they need when that happens. And they can say, these are places we think it's worth paying a little bit more than just doing business as usual replacement or repair. We want to build in some wildlife enha enhancements. Here's why. Here's the crash data. Here's like all the justification for it. We don't know if that will get any more money to these places, but I think it's worth trying and being ready. And then if that doesn't work, we'll create something else. You know, we'll figure out what what didn't work and was missing um, and go after it next time. Oh, and I did want to end with before we go into questions, I just I had to show a video. Um, and then actually I'm going to read. I can't see it on my screen when I'm sharing the screen, but way back in 2014, when we had uh, volunteer wildlife trackers going out all the time and doing tracking and coming back and seeing these wildlife photos. Um, one of our volunteers, Nancy Rich, who lives out in Chesterfield, wrote this beautiful essay. Um, and I'm just going to pull that up so that I can read part of it um, to you. She wrote an essay that actually she won a, a contest with, which was pretty cool, um, just about some of her impressions when she was out there. And I want to end with, with her words, which I'm using with her permission to share them. So when so she wrote about that video of the otter that you just see, the wildlife camera shows an otter sliding on the ice toward the river. While otters are related to the loping fisher and the bounding weasel, they move in a completely different way, pulling themselves along by the front feet as the back feet draw together by the tail, and the heavy plump body heaves and rolls until it reaches a gliding point. The fisher, however, darts, turning a quick and powerful body this way and that while inspecting the camera. I want to see the land where I live, hear it, feel it, smell it, be touched by the cold, follow my animal neighbor's doings. I want more than guidebook identifications. I want to hear the stories in the woods. And I am hearing more stories. Really, it's these opportunities to be outside, watching, listening, following, that allow me to listen better. By paying attention and being there and considering animals as he and she and not it, my hearing begins to come back. So I just want to end with those words from Nancy. I'm really grateful to her for capturing some of the um, things I think we all felt with that study and really every time that we're out there with these animals collecting data on them, yes, but um, you know, all in service of making sure that this place where they live continues to work for them well into the future. Um, and with that, I'm happy to turn this into discussion and questions. I'd love to hear what you guys are doing, love to answer questions that you have. Um, and just spend the rest of the time in, in conversation. Oh, and thank you for the training. I just saw it in the chat. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> December 8th. Yeah, if anyone is interested in that, it's, uh, I don't think there will be a lot of opportunities to learn the, how, how to do this. So if you, if you think you wanna go out and wait around and measure culverts, um, uh, yeah, talk to Jane. <laughs> And this one specifically is terrestrial passage. And thank you, Paul, for putting that in there. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Um, Thanks so much. Paul put his info in there as well, and he's keeping track of the participants. So you can reach out to him through email if anyone's interested. Wonderful. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute, pop it in the chat, um, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, sorry, I see a question. Are there any species that are driving additional efforts to a certain area? Yeah, um, so when we work with mass DOT and mass wildlife, they're always really interested in species of special concern or, um, you know, so endangered or threatened species. Um, in this area, there is a lot of habitat focus on New England cottontail. And in fact, again, 10 years, you do a lot of stuff. Jane, I am remembering vials that I had <laughs> um, so that if we saw bunny poop, <laughs> we could put it in the vial and send it to Mass Wildlife and they could do some DNA sequencing. Um, that That's kind of a fun memory. I can picture the bag that I had them in. Uh, so, yeah, Emma, I would say that the rare species are definitely drawing attention. There also have been um, species specific studies on moose and bear. So there are researchers that have put collars on both of those species and have a sense of where they're moving. And there is even a, um, a set of really interesting studies. Um, I am unfortunately forgetting her name. There's a researcher who was working at UMass Amherst at the time, it'll come back to me, um, and she put together a hotspot study. So she was looking at places where um, there's lots of movement of, of moose, in this case, across the road based on a model that she had that used animal vehicle collisions to say, well, that's clearly a place that isn't safe for moose to move. And the collars, you know, they went back and forth like 20, 10 times, maybe that's a safer place. Um, so that's another set of species that I think people have, have really focused on. And I know early on, Mass DOT wasn't collecting uh, animal vehicle crash data well. Am I right that they now really are? You know, I have not talked with the DOT staff since I remember that conversation. They were about to get a smartphone app that was going to enable them to just like enter things instead of having to go back and like log in and um I have not checked with them to see if that happened, but I remember that too, Jane. I know that when when we were doing the um, uh, culvert studies, they were talking about that and we're excited about it because it often fell to the same people who like, you know, they shovel. The DOT guys are like the most excited about reducing roadkill, I think, of anybody. They have to shovel it off the roads. They do not want to see that happen. Also, it's sad. They don't like to see the dead animals, but it's just, it's not on all levels, it's not good for them. And um, they were super helpful. These are the guys in the district offices because they just, they see it and anything that they could do to maybe make the road safer for people and not have a bunch of, you know, dead splattered coyotes and deer and everything was, was positive. Um, Jane, that's maybe something I'll ask next time I talk to DOT just to check in, like, did that happen? And also, Jane, I'm sure you have mentioned to people that anyone can be a citizen scientist in terms of reporting roadkill at the Linking Landscapes um, website. So it's linkinglandscapes.info. It's got a really easy interface uh, and anyone can report, you know, this is a species I saw it was at this location. You don't have to have a GPS on you. You can actually um, zoom in using a Google map. So if you know it's like at this corner uh, with this driveway, you know, you can, you can sort of uh, zoom in that way. And that's really helpful. That stuff does turn into, for example, the report that I showed. Like that, that information actually gets used. And it doesn't have to be a dead animal. It can be a live animal crossing or dead. Right. Turtles, salamanders. There's like there's modules in that website that are really useful. I'm just going to take this quick pause to acknowledge uh, Jean Chaggy back, oh boy, it has to have been at least 10 years ago, was one of the first volunteers with Trout Unlimited who was doing the surveying 
of the aquatic passage. Oh, and nice. every year they would change the forms and poor Jean <laughs> went through all the different forms. He was just amazing. And thank you, Jean. It really has come to a point where things are, are changing because of people who were out there doing all those surveys from the very beginning. Absolutely. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, Judy asked if I could repeat the website to report roadkill or or crossings. It's linkinglandscapes.info. And maybe um, maybe Chelsea or Jane, you could just type it into the chat. Oh, thanks, Jane. Perfect. I'm actually going to make sure that they didn't change it. I looked at it pretty recently, but I want to I don't want to send you guys to the wrong place. Yep, still hi, up hi. there. Hi, Laura. This is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Thank How you for you? being part of the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage Partnership for so long. <laughs> I want to thank you for being at the Green Drinks because it reminds me that I have to remind my colleagues at Regional Planning about this initiative and make sure that when there's transportation planning, when there's road projects or open space, open space planning, like Beckett right now is updating their open space plan. Um, it reminds me that I have to remind them to think about this as uh, open space planning is perfect. You know, where do mm -hmm. towns want to strategize um, conservation? So thank you for doing this because it reminds me that I have to remind them. Sure. And thank you for working with us. Uh a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago at this point, yeah. to get all of the information that we had into the regional transportation plans. I, I remember we had that for FERCOG, PVPC, and BRPC, which was really great. So we got the, the whole area covered. And in the chat, yes, there's two different things being discussed. So linkinglandscapes.info is the site run by um, Mass Wildlife and maybe Mass DOT as well, where you can go and report uh, wildlife that you've seen that has been, you know, like dead wildlife on the road. Um, and then the map that I showed where you can play around with where are the priority road segments, where are the priority connectivity areas in the linkage, that is the shortened URL for that. It's hosted on a site called Database, and, but the shortened URL is, is as someone put in the chat, um, bit, uh, as Jeff put in the chat, bit.do slash linkage map. Wonderful. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I don't know that I have any. Um, so if nobody else does, maybe you will end early. I'm not sure. Does anyone have any? Yes, uh, so Emma asked, will this recording be available online? It will um, on Beat's YouTube channel, and I think our handle is just uh, the Beat News on YouTube. Oh. oh, and Elaine, sorry, Elaine put something in. Williamstown on Route 2. <clears throat> The map of habitat area doesn't show that there would be passage, uh, meaning the linkage map. The Elaine, are you looking at um, at the interactive map, the bit.do slash linkage map? Um, yeah, I am. Yep. Um, so I like zoomed way in, and so mm -hmm. I see like Green River and Water Street, and Williamstown just put. In so the area along there is like all preserved all along the Green mm -hmm. River all the way down to the Hoosick. And okay. the wildlife comes through, comes out of Stone Hill, goes through the Taconic, comes down through the cemetery, and mm -hmm. then um, is going to have safe passage underneath Route 2. Awesome. Because um, they're putting a, a raised pathway in through there that's going to be pedestrian and terrestrial that'll take them all the way 
um, in this area down to the Green River. So it's just like that's great. That'll be another area that's more connected than it is currently. Sure. That's that's great. I'm really excited to hear that, especially because Route 2 is such a such a big barrier there. Um, I think the other thing to remember about the map, that particular map, is that it is not very smart. So it doesn't have the data even that we collected on um, terrestrial passage. What that map knows is, OK, on either side of this oval here the ovals aren't real right they're just representing a connection on either side of where i'm standing here is stuff that looks like really good habitat and part of it is protected permanently so if that's connected now great i don't want to lose that if it's not connected now i want to restore it but the map knows the where it doesn't know the how and similarly for the roads that gets updated as people go out and do new um surveys of those roads and we'll find that everything can move through there but similarly the map isn't very smart the map knows that here is a barrier here is a road that if it's a barrier to wildlife passage that's a big problem because again it's in an important place with good habitat on either side but until we go and get on the ground and see what is happening under those uh culverts and bridges then we don't know whether it is actually a barrier right now or just a potential barrier. So I am excited to hear about that update from you, Elaine. And we have a couple places in Route 20 too, where they sort of upgraded things and everything's really good now. That is, is nothing but good news. Um, and apologies for not explaining before that that map is really showing you this is a place I would, I would look, I would measure, I'd collect data, I would talk with people on the ground. But again, it, it isn't, it's not super smart. It doesn't know what you're going to find when you get there. Um, it just, it just wants you to take a look. So that's really great. And I wrote that down, Elaine, because um, we do keep track of the mass pike and route two. I mean, they're the, they're the big ones, right? That are cutting the entire linkage. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to hear that, especially having put wildlife cameras out in North Adams at a site that then ultimately couldn't be improved because of the, just because of the rules that DOT had to follow in terms of um, flood, you know, flood management and prevention. So that's really cool to hear. Thank you for that. I think one of the other things about the map is, well, when you had said, if you put all the roads in, that other map would turn all purple. Mm -hmm. A lot of the roads that are showing up here are ones that are state owned or yes. are major connectors. So one of the things um, to Lauren's point, we're working with regional planning on looking at the municipal level so we can look at important municipal roads to be able to get them under as well. And uh, Courtney Morehouse is helping with getting that municipal focus going. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, that is a, yeah, there's a working, there are working groups within the Berkshire Wildlife Linkage that just like go off on their own and figure this stuff out. And that's, I'm really grateful for that group too. Um, I did see another question, Chelsea, come up, which is when you identify a culvert or other structure to improve, do you deal with any resistance at the town slash city or community level? Um, so, I guess I would answer that in a couple ways. Um, towns and cities don't have the money to do a lot of this stuff. So certainly if, I mean, I, I have never gone to a town and said, I think you should spend a bunch of money to fix this culvert for wildlife. That would probably not go over very well if I did. I'm just guessing because um, especially some of the small towns, they just, that would wipe out their whole budget. That one culvert, it'd be it. They couldn't do snow plowing, like done. Um, so uh, that is one reason that working with the state is a little bit easier because they they do they don't have unlimited money, but they tend to have more resources. I did go to a lot of towns early on. In general, I think there's plenty of support for the wildlife corridor. I think most towns, they recognize what they have in important open space and wildlife. You know, people people like wildlife. They like seeing it. They don't like seeing roadkill. Um, they don't like 
towns and municipalities don't like having culverts that blow out every time there's a big storm event. So, you know, that doesn't help anybody. So they're, I think in general, they're perfectly happy to see things improve. It's mostly a question of money. And then every once in a while, there's also a question of just logistics. So for example, on the Mass Pike, uh, between, well, now it's exit 45 and 41 and whatever it is, exit two and three, for those of us who have lived here longer than a year, uh, between exits two and three is a really long stretch. You can't just shut that down to fix a culvert like that. It's just, it's not, it's not feasible um, unless you do it really quickly, you know, unless you can just, uh, keep that to a small thing. So people do creative things. They do like directional drilling and stuff like that. But on some of the really major roads, there is a logistics problem and pushback. Um, but Emma, I don't, I don't think I've gotten pushback. I haven't, I mean, knock on wood, the only pushback I can remember getting um, on this was a couple, there were a couple landowners who just weren't comfortable with having a wildlife camera um, near their property. And that's fair. You know, there were privacy issues and there were a couple that were just like, nope, we just, I know it's not, I know it's the right of way, right? I always ask, even if it's technically not their property. Um, but they, they just, they didn't want that. And that was fine. So we didn't put wildlife cameras out there. Actually, we did get, we got an amazing note from one landowner who didn't want the trackers on their land. I remember that one now. I saved it for a while. Um, because he was fine with like people being on his land, but he didn't want them to be tracking the wildlife because winter was a really tough time for the wildlife. And he was worried that the trackers would stress out the wildlife and then they wouldn't be able to make it through the winter. And I was like, that is the best. Yep. No, we are just crossing. That is the best rejection I think <laughs> I've gotten. Um, our trackers were very, very careful. They backtrack. They weren't, you know, chasing. But I just loved that his reason for saying no was because he was too concerned about the wildlife. I was like, that we'll take that. That is, it's great. That's awesome. So we uh, we took him out of the out of the study area. Awesome, thank you. Um, so last call for questions. Thank you for everyone who's asked questions and shared their experiences. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any other questions before we, we end Green Drinks tonight? I just wanna thank Laura again, because we all we hear is bad news and loss of habitat and climate change. And it's so nice to hear that there are small wins because it just little tiny successes give you that impetus to keep going. And it's nice to see little successes and they kind of add up and it's just kind of, it just feels good that we're doing something and, and there's a, a result at the end of the day. And then, you know, there's great pictures of wildlife. I mean, how fun is that? <laughs> right, can't go wrong with that. Thank you so much, Lauren. I mean, who doesn't want to, you know, who doesn't want to see animals, you know, sliding on their belly? How wonderful. <laughs> <Right. laughs> oh, this winter, we're going to be trying to go out and track 24 hours after every snowstorm at Churchill Brook to see, hopefully, wildlife crossing under Churchill Street instead of the way it used to be with deer hanging out in the road. Uh, so really hopeful Wonderful. that that will be good assuming we actually get some snow this winter fingers crossed yeah that'll be really that'll be great to see jane and if anybody is interested you can email me jane at thebeatnews.org and i'll put you perfect i will put you on my list jeff um to come out and check it out great and thank you so much laura thank you everyone for being here um, this was fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good to